Okay, so um, we're starting with um, issues of sampling bias. Um, we spoke yesterday about how all of our data is biased in one way or another, um, either by um, the way that we've been collecting the data, um, or, well, actually, yes, basically how we've been collecting the data and, and what, what data is available to us. Um, and there are some techniques that we can apply to try to counter these biases in the way that we model. Um, so, we were talking um, about how, for, for our species, for any um, variable, we've got our ideal response, say this is uh, temperature range, we've got our sort of minimum uh, maximum threshold, and we've got a sort of ideal um, our, um, temperature range or variable range, so we're right in the middle. But if we sample in a biased way, biased within this environmental space, we can end up with an environmental profile that looks very different to what the actual profile is. So the bias, our sampling bias, may give us uh, misleading information about uh, the environmental requirements of our species. So you know, ideally we want to try to sample as wide as, wide as we can in an environmental space in order to avoid this misinterpretation of uh, the um, environmental response. So um, I'm just highlighting a, 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 a study that tries to um, demonstrate how sampling bias affects how we interpret environmental response. So this is by Paul Tower in 2008, and they looked at, I think this was uh, beetles, uh, and they looked at historical collections uh, over time. So this was, this was uh, uh, data from up to 1900, the 1930s, 30s to 70s, 70s plus. And what they did is that they used this data and they drilled down into environmental layers such as temperature. And they looked at the uh, <coughs> profiles of each of these environmental variables based on these different time series of data and showed basically how different the environmental response looks based on the sampling effort over time. Um, so you can get really very different signals just because of the, of the sampling bias. So a real example of, of the sort of issues that we might face. Okay, so um, a quick summary of what causes uh, uh, observation of bias. So we know that when we collect, we are more likely to collect uh, uh, easily accessible areas. And so we need to try to keep these things in mind. If we've got, if we can look at our data and can look at our data in relation to these obvious things that may uh, cause our sampling bias, such as roads and rivers. Okay, we, have, we have GIS data that tells us where roads are, where rivers are. We look at our data in relation to these and we can try to understand if we have a bias in our data. Okay. Towns and coasts, um, you know, basically places that are easier for people to get to these are more likely to be sampled. And on a, this is on a sort of local scale, and on a, 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 a larger scale, a more global scale, we know that um, certain countries tend to be oversampled relative to others. So we showed yesterday the map of uh, data available on GLIF, and uh, it, it's showing um, European countries being particularly well sampled in relation to other areas. But also there's this, um, there's this pattern of uh, biodiversity hotspots being sampled. And um, some people um, have been looking at this. Um, I think Peter Linder has been doing something on this. Um, essentially, the biodiversity hotspots become self-fulfilling prophecies because once somebody hears that this is a biodiversity hotspot, then scientists and researchers are more likely to go back there and collect more data 
and then that area looks even more diverse. Um, and then people still keep going back there. And so there's, 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 there's this argument that there's a false impression of the relative diversity of some areas just because once it's known as a hotspot, people are more likely to go back there and resample. This is something else you need to keep in mind. So um, we're going to talk about methodology for um, trying to correct bias in our observation data. And I've sort of grouped this into sort of three thematic ways that we can try to, to, to combat bias. Um, the first is to, in some way, produce a subset of our distribution data that removes some of the bias. So this is subsampling our data uh, to a reduced data set that, is, uh, that removes some of the, essentially the, removes the oversampling bias in some areas. The second approach is to try to quantify the bias and then in some way feed this bias data into the model so that the model knows about the bias. And the third method is to try to um, alter our background of using um, background data or the presence only model so that the background data also reflects the same sort of bias that our occurrence data does. And in this way, the two biases can be, uh, can, can be shown to cancel each other out and produce a, a model that uh, is, less, is, is less affected by that bias. I'm going to go into these in detail, starting with subsampling. Okay. So the, the idea that um, within, here's a sort of simple block up, this is our, this is our environmental grid, okay? and the red dots are our distribution data. And some areas we think are oversampled. Now, the, the most commonly used technique to try to combat this oversampling is what we might call data thinning. Okay? So um, it's essentially it's the default setting for example MaxEnd or uh, Open Modeler or many of the um, many of the common um, modeling uh, softwares to take this data and thin out data that are overrepresented in individual pixels. So you start with multiple pixels in, uh, sorry, multiple uh, observations in each pixel, and what you actually model with is one in each pixel, so that you're ignoring the multiple hits in this area and just treating each pixel as a present <coughs> or absent in each of your area. Okay. This is this is the default behavior for most modeling. Yeah. Uh, sorry, but if the presence is more dense, uh, yeah. So, what do you do? so we're assuming that we're doing presence absence, absence modeling, and we're blind to <coughs> abundance. Okay. If you want to do abundance modeling, okay, then <coughs> you might use the um, density uh, of sampling in that area. Or, you know, the, the, the density of observations in the area to interpret that as abundance. But if you've got abundance data, then essentially you've also got some kind of absence data with your data set. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how, do you have a me methodology for this? Because there's software. And so essentially, all, all of the major software, MaxEnd, OpenModeler, um, this is a standard practice to thin your data so that you but take. Really, well, I mean, this is when you have multiple records within a within the grid side. So yes. Eliminates them, but yes. I have lots of let's say you use a species and you download data from GBIF. Yes. You get thirty thousand records from the UK. Yes. So to to equally spread them all over your study area, Maxent will not do that for you. So you have to use no. specific tools so, for it. Yeah, so, so um, well, if you, if you were to take that data where you're um, heavily oversampled in one area, what you end up with is 
each pixel in your oversampled area will have a presence and absence, um, sorry, a, pre a presence record, okay? So that does thin the data down, yeah? So you start with 10,000 records in the UK and you end up with 1,000 records in the UK, okay? But they're still all together, so I'm yes. talking about... Um, yeah, so, so essentially what you're, you're saying is... Yeah, spatial, spatial, there will be cluster. Yes. Like really dense clusters, not within the same cell, but just in general. We're getting to that. Ah, sorry, <laughs> sorry. No, I just want to say there's a nice tool for that. Well, I want okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if I can contribute to that because I'm working actually with a team that is developing, that are using Graph P to, to do more or less this thing, but yeah. using Graph so, because in Graph there is the concept of maximum independent sets. Yeah. And you can just see that as a graph. Each node, each point there is like a node graph, and it's linked, and each, each, each edge has a value. It's kind of the distance. If it is in environmental space, it's the environmental distance between the points. If it is in geographic space, it can be the, the geographic distance between points. And then using that, that strategy as graphs, you can select the, the maximum numbers of points that you see as independent. Yeah. And then you can select that, that set of points that are different, different, point, different sets of points that are in yeah. And you can use the, that points to, to see the, the models. Yeah, yeah. so uh, essentially, if I'm understanding correctly, you're, you're, you're talking about a, a weighting system. So that you're saying that your density clustered points in some way count less towards your model because they're not independent from each other. Yeah, but in this case, we have to define basically what, what what the edge, the edges mean, basically. So in, in our case, we are basically ranking. If we have, say, 100 points, we have all the distances between pairs of points, so a huge number of, point, of, of, of edges, and you select, we say that, well, the 10% the, the most, most, yeah, most, the, no, the most, the, 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 the most uh, closely by points are the ones that we assume that is no independent. So we are using the many ones as you can. Yeah. But I think it, it is going to depend totally on the species because some birds, for instance, have social behavior and they put an illness where the other, the other birds have uh, a, a, a nest before. So they are clamped, but, but because this, this is the real situation. Yeah. So it is. Yeah, so it's so. Once again, we have to we have to know and understand the biology yeah. of our organism before we can interpret how we want to, to, to do our work. Yeah, it is, I, I cannot find with the software you have to do kernel density. Yeah. Probably it, then this, this software randomly eliminates from the current these areas with high density eliminates records. So it's really following yeah. on. So it's follow, the, following on from this yeah. method where you're weighing your points based yeah. on the. Uh, their geographic uh, nearness to other points, and then subsampling from that based on a um, based on a probability of sampling that's inversely. Yeah, the Actually, you can use both the geographical cost, the geographical dimension and the environmental dimension, and both one, the other, or both both together. Yeah. You can use also st uh, spatial statistics and measure if the distribution of points is uh, cluster or. Yeah. Uh, Regular distribution, and you can begin to delete points using local indicators of special association or other method. Yeah. And with the nearest neighbor for index, you can check if you still have the, the, the distribution of regular distributed. So, so, so essentially, what we're getting to is that um, there are a number of techniques that allow us to essentially thin our data down so that we model with data that is more evenly distributed across the range so that we're not heavily sampled in one area and less sampled in another area. We basically thin out the oversampled areas so that we're more evenly spread. So this is the default behavior for most uh, our, our modeling software where we just take one observation per pixel but sometimes this isn't enough and we can try extra thinning 
Okay? And so we've just heard a bunch of different examples that, that we could employ. Another one here is we're treating a, a more densely sampled area and we're going to thin out that more densely sampled area even more by saying, okay, well, I'm going to consider a bigger pixel size, for example, and I'm just going to subsample from these four pixels and take one of these out. Okay? So we're thinning down a larger area okay, so that we're reducing the sampling in an oversampled area. So uh, uh, there, uh, that was an example from um, some work by Andy Davis and John Gwinnett looking at coral distributions where they did the initial thinning and thought that some areas were really heavily sampled and so they just employed a coarser pix uh, pixelated grid thinned out to that level and then modelled with that data. Of course the issue with thinning your data is that you're taking your, your, a large data set that you spend lots of time collecting and then you're discarding lots of that data. And that's nice if you've got lots and lots of data, but if you've got a limited amount of data, then removing it, you know, removing some of it, then gets you in a position you've got smaller data sets, and obviously we model with smaller data sets and we're less sure of our um, results. So, uh, alternative is to try to um, quantify what your bias is and then feed this directly into the model. So the, the example that I'm um, uh, looking at here is um, within that set you can uh, create a bias grid um, where additional to your environmental grid and where your points are you can feed in an extra grid here represented by the, by the blue numbers that in some way describe the amount of sampling effort that has been applied to each of these areas. And in this way, the model knows that this area has been heavily sampled, and in this way, these observations will be downweighted. Okay? Whereas this area has been poorly sampled, but we still found something. Okay? So relatively speaking, this this area might count for more than any individual point in this area. Okay? So we've got a we've got a quantification of our sampling bias and we feed that bias into the model. Okay? The difficulty with this is it, it can be difficult to quantify what your sampling bias is. And so in theory it's nice, in practice it's, it's difficult to quantify your sampling bias unless you've done, you know, you've done your own sampling and you've got an idea of where you've visited and what sort of time and effort. It's really very difficult to do this with data that you haven't collected and you have no idea, you know, well, so for example downloading data from GBIC and then trying to quantify what the sampling bias is on that data. That's really a difficult process and you need to understand the data very well in order to, 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 to do this. Um, I think I've just said that. It's difficult to quantify sampling. <laughs> Um, yeah. So um, trying to do this from museum collected data, you really need to research <coughs> the individual collection trips, what they were attempting to sample, um, and uh, uh, to, to try to get a handle on uh, sampling effort is, is very difficult. Um, especially for historical sample, uh, sampling trips where it's difficult to get information about what the intentions of the collection were. 